there is a God, and as such, he communicates to man in a way that we can understand. The Bible tells us that he spoke to Adam and said, where art thou? We have every reason to believe that he used a voice which sounded just like a human voice. He spoke to Noah, he spoke to Joshua, he spoke to Samuel. That's a dramatic illustration. Recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 3, a little boy, he was sleeping one night, and he heard a voice saying, Samuel, Samuel. He awakened thinking it was Eli, the high priest, calling him, for the voice which he heard sounded just like a human voice. If our God wants to communicate to us in a written form, it's logical to assume that he would use a language which looks like a man's language, and it would be printed in a book which would look like any kind of a human book, but that book would be different. It would be a book from God. This is the first in a series of 13 lessons on the Holy Bible, and in this series we hope to give you a broad overview of the Bible. We're not going to be able to zero in on a specific book or a specific chapter and spend very long. But we want to give you a broad overview. Men walked upon the earth for literally thousands of years. They didn't know it was round. Today we can show someone in five minutes more about the earth than our ancestors knew in four or five thousand years of trudging around its jungles and sailing across its oceans. And we hope in this series of 13 lessons to cause the Bible to come together and to start making sense to you. There are 3,566,480 different letters in the Bible. There are 773,746 words in the Bible. There are 31,102 verses in the Bible. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And there are 66 books in the Bible. Some of you have had Bibles all of your lives but have never read them. You've been a little bit intimidated. You've started several times through the book of Genesis, but you got discouraged before you got very far. In this series of 13 lessons, we want to give you an overview of the Bible so that you won't be afraid of it. It's a fascinating book, and once you are convinced that this book is from God, it can literally transform your life. Let me give you several unusual facts about the Bible. First of all, it is the most sought after and the most widely published book in the world. The very first book to ever be printed on a printing press was the Holy Bible. It was printed by John Gutenberg. Gutenberg was born in the last decade of the 14th century and devoted his life literally and his fortune literally to the printing of the Bible. He thought more of the Bible than he did of marriage. He thought more of the Bible than he did of his own personal fortune. It's an ironic fact from history that the very first Gutenberg Bible was not even printed by John Gutenberg because his printing presses had been repossessed. The Bible was printed in 1455, but in 1454, John Gutenberg was forbidden to even enter his own print shop. And he didn't hold in his hands the first copy of the Gutenberg Bible until the summer of 1456. But the Bible is an unusual book in that wherever you travel in the world today, in more languages and dialects than any other book that has ever been printed, you will find the Holy Bible. The Bible is an unusual book in that it is the best authenticated book in history. I have here with me a little book by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. On page 42 of this book, there is an interesting chart listing 16 authors of antiquity. Authors like Caesar and Livy and Plato and Tacitus and Pliny the Younger and Thucydides and Suetonius and Herodotus and Horace and Sophocles and Lucretius and Catullus and Euripides and Demosthenes and Aristotle and Aristophanes. The second column lists when these various authors wrote. The third column lists the earliest manuscript available of their writing. The next column lists the time span separating these authors from the manuscripts. And finally, the number of manuscripts which we have available. When we come to the writings of Tacitus, we find there is only one ancient manuscript. When we come to the writings of Lucretius, we find there are two, Catullus, three, Euripides, nine, Plato, seven, and so forth. But with reference to the Holy Bible, would you believe 24,000 manuscripts, 5,000 manuscripts and manuscript fragments in the Greek language, 10,000 in the Latin Vulgate, and 9,000 manuscripts and manuscript fragments of other ancient translations of the Bible? 
No other book in all the history of humanity is so well authenticated as the Holy Bible. This book is also the most persecuted book in history. Let me just give you one example, then we'll talk about it in greater detail later on. But in the year 303, the emperor Diocletian burned the Bible, and over its ashes he placed a sign which read, Extincto Nomine Christianorum, which indicated his belief that the name of Christ had been extinguished from the earth. Nine years later, Diocletian was gone, and Constantine was the emperor of Rome. And Constantine proclaimed himself a Christian and emblazoned the sign of the cross upon the shields of the Roman soldiers. And he commissioned the bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius, to produce 50 Bibles of the finest quality so that the churches of God might find instruction from God. This is the only book which presents really a rationale for human history, telling man where he came from, where he is going, and why he is here upon this earth. It is the only book that is alive and active and filled with power. But we're going to talk about that in greater detail in a few moments. Let me talk to you a little bit about the claims of the Bible. When you open the Bible, you will be impressed by the fact that it seems to speak for God. The first words of the Bible are these. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And on the first page of the Bible, over and over again, you read such words as, God said let there be light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. There are 680 claims to inspiration in the books of Moses. You get into the words of prophecy and you will find again that God claimed to be speaking, or at least these men who were prophets claimed that God was speaking through them. Reading now from Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and he touched my mouth and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words into thy mouth. There are 1,307 claims to inspiration in the words of the prophet. There are 418 claims of inspiration in the books of history. There are 195 claims to inspiration in the books of poetry. John Wesley mused over the claims of the Bible and then concluded that there were five alternatives regarding the origin of Scripture. First of all, he said, it came from good men or bad men. It came from good angels or bad angels or from God. And those were the only five alternatives which were available. Then Wesley continued, it couldn't have come from good men or good angels because it claimed to be from God. And if it was not from God, whoever did write it was lying. And good men and good angels could not be responsible for a lie. Neither could it have come from bad men and bad angels because the book is basically good. It has blessed every individual and every society where it has ever been believed and practiced. It is the kind of a book which bad men could not have written if they would and would not have written if they could. Therefore, John Wesley concluded, the Bible came from God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Another very interesting thing about this book is its amazing unity. It was written by 40 or 50 different men over a period of 15 or 1600 years on three different continents, and yet it tells the same story. Now, if you were a juror and several witnesses all said identically the same thing, you would immediately assume there had been some kind of collusion outside the courtroom, that there had been a mastermind who had told these witnesses what to say. And that's what we must conclude about the Bible, that the Bible is the result of one man. It was written by people from different occupations. Nehemiah, for example, was a butler, and David and Solomon were kings. Uh, Daniel was a statesman, but Amos was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamine trees. Uh, Peter and John were unlettered fishermen, but Paul was a highly educated Pharisee. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were priests, but Luke was a Gentile physician. And yet wherever these men wrote and whatever they wrote, they all wrote essentially the same thing. All the pieces of Scripture fit together like a gigantic puzzle. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
All the scriptures are inspired of God, and they are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let me give to you just a little contrast between the first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible, and the amazing unity which we see between these two books of the Bible is illustrative of the unity which can be found in all the books of the Bible. In the first book of the Bible, we read that God created all things. In the last book of the Bible, we discover that God will make all things new. In the first book of the Bible, we find that God created the heavens and the earth. In the last book of the Bible, we discover He will create a new heavens and a new earth. In the first book of the Bible, He created the sun and the moon for light. In the last book of the Bible, we read that there will no longer be a need for the sun or the moon. In the first book of the Bible, we read that darkness was called night. But in the last book of the Bible, we are promised there will be no darkness. In the first book of the Bible, we read of God allowing pain to be upon the earth. In the last book of the Bible, we discover that God is going to abolish pain from the earth. In the book of Genesis, we read of the appearance of Satan. In the book of Revelation, we read of his disappearance. In the first book of the Bible, we find the beginning of curses. In the last book of the Bible, we find that curses, curses will be abolished. In the first book of the Bible, man was driven from the tree of life. In the last book of the Bible, man is restored to the tree of life. In the first book of the Bible, God placed cherubim at the garden to keep man away from the precincts of the tree of life. But in the last book of the Bible, we discover that the gates will never be shut. In the first book of the Bible, we discover that man is driven from the presence of God. In the last book of the Bible, we discover that man is reconciled to the presence of God. In the, in the book of Genesis, we find the origin of death. In the book of Revelation, we find the abolition from death. The Bible is an amazing book. It is unified like no other book that has ever been written upon the face of the earth. The next thing about the Bible that I want to point out is that it is an indestructible book. A few moments ago, I told you about Diocletian. Let's go back in the Roman emperors to the days of Nero. He was the man who put the apostles Peter and Paul to death and caused literally thousands of Christians to be thrown to the lions and burned at the stake. In about the year A.D. 67, his legions advanced upon the city of Jerusalem. And down near the Dead Sea, there was a religious community called the Qumran community. And they were familiar enough with history to know that when pagans advanced on Jerusalem, it was rough on the Bible. Uh, 150 or so years before that time, maybe a couple of hundred years, Antiochus Epiphanes, the infamous Syrian king, advanced on Jerusalem. He desecrated the temple. He offered a swine upon the temple altar, and he burned every copy of the Bible that he could find. And so the Qumran community, risking their very lives, went back into these caves and hid not treasures of gold and silver and precious stones, but they hid something far more valuable than that. They hid the treasure of the Word of God, copies of the book of Isaiah, of the Hebrew Scriptures. I have here a little um, article from Eternity Magazine. And on the front of this is a picture of a fragment found in one of the caves of the, of the Dead Sea. And uh, the title says, Could the one tiny fragment shake the world? Maybe so, because this is a portion of the Gospel of Mark which dates back to the year A.D. 50, well into the first century. It was contemporary with the apostles of Jesus Christ who walked upon the earth. And so these men didn't want the Bible to be destroyed, and they went out in these caves and they hid the Bible. They hid it so well it was nearly 2,000 years before it was discovered. A little Bedouin goat herd back in 1947 found these scrolls by accident, one of the great discoveries of our lifetime. But Nero was not the only emperor to persecute the church. Following him was the emperor Domitian. Domitian was the individual who caused John the Apostle to be imprisoned on the island of Patmos where he had his visions of the book of Revelation. After him came the emperor Trajan, and then Hadrian, and then Antonius Pius, and then Marcus Aurelius, and then Septimius Severus, and then Maximin, and then Decius, and then Valerian, and finally to Diocletian. Here were some of the most powerful and influential men on earth, and they felt like they had destroyed the Bible 
And Diocletian put up this sign that the name of Jesus was now extinguished from the earth. Nine years later, as I mentioned, it had conquered his empire, but the Bible had never been destroyed. Not by Diocletian, not by all of these emperors of Rome, not by anyone, because it is eternal. Heaven and earth shall pass away, said Jesus, but my word shall not pass away. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8, the Bible teaches us that the flowers may wither and the grass may fade, but the Word of God abides forever. There's an old poem that brings this truth to mind about an anvil. It goes like this. Last eve I passed beside a blacksmith's shop and heard the anvil ringing out the vespers chime. And looking in I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, I said, to wear and batter all those hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so thought I, the anvil of God's word. For years the skeptic's blows have beat upon, yet while the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, and the hammers are gone. For those of us who are English-speaking people, it's interesting to note that the very first man to translate the Bible into the English language was John Wycliffe. He translated from the Latin Vulgate. He was persecuted during his lifetime, but he died a natural death. Over 40 years later, his body was exhumed, and he was tried as a heretic and condemned. His bones were burned and his ashes cast into the River Swift. Chief among his crimes was the crime of translating the Bible into the English language. Then came William Tyndall, the first man to translate the Bible into English from a Greek and Hebrew manuscript. The master of seven languages, a dedicated and diligent individual. He was strangled at the stake on October the 6th, 1536. His crime? The translation of the Bible into the English language. The last words upon his lips before he died were these. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Seventy-five years later, James, the king of England, authorized the Bible. It was the year 1611. We call that Bible the authorized version or the King James version of the Bible. We are told that 90% of the King James Bible was the work of the dedicated Christian martyr who died 75 years earlier for translating the Bible into English, William Tyndall. No other book in all the world has ever been persecuted like the Bible. Yet interestingly enough, there are more copies of the Bible in the world today than any other book. There are more ancient manuscripts of the Bible than any other author of antiquity. The next thing about the Bible that I want to say is that it's a book which foretells the future. Some have said that one out of every three verses in the Bible is a prophetic verse. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I do know that in the 46th chapter of the book of Isaiah, the scriptures teach... I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. The word Chautauqua will probably not be a familiar word to many of you who view this, but back in the United States many years ago, when people didn't have television to watch, they would sometimes go to a performance put on by the Chautauqua. At one time, the Red Path Chautauqua hired the, uh, the famed criminal lawyer Clarence Darrell to travel around the country and debate preachers or other believers about the Christian faith. Darrell was himself an unbeliever and a very clever and famous individual. Matter of fact, he boasted that he had never had any of his clients receive the death penalty regardless of the crime which they committed. Loeb and Leopold murdered little Bobby Franks in cold murder, but the brilliant Clarence Darrell was able to get them off with life sentences. He came to Canton, Ohio, and the local ministers asked P.H. Welshimer if he would debate the great criminal lawyer. Well, uh, Mr. Darrell stood up and said nobody believed in Bible prophecies anymore but a jackass, not realizing that that would be one of the major reasons why Mr. Welshimer said he did believe the Bible. When the debate was over, Mr. Welshimer had presented such a good case that it was obvious to everyone who was there that he had won. And two weeks later, the ministers of Akron, Ohio, invited Mr. Welshmer to come down and debate Mr. Darrow again. Before the curtain was raised, the great criminal lawyer leaned over and apologized to the preacher. He said, Mr. Welshmer, 
I want to apologize for my rude remarks. I didn't realize that any man of intelligence actually studied prophecy, and I'm going to have to admit if I'm going to debate men of your caliber, I'm going to have to do a lot more studying. Well, there was a sense, I suppose, in which Mr. Welshimer preached a funeral for the famed lawyer because within two weeks Clarence Darrow was dead. When Mr. Welshimer stood for his last rebuttal, he pointed the long finger of accusation into the face of the unbelieving Clarence Darrow. And he said, Alas for him who does not see the stars shine through his cypress trees, who hopeless lays his dead away, nor waits to see the waking day across the mournful marbles play, who has not learned in hours of faith the truth of life and sense unknown, that life is ever Lord of death, and love can never lose its own. But as for you and me, we shall live on. Fourteen thousand people rose to their feet in a spontaneous display of approval, and they applauded for eight long minutes until Mr. Welshaber himself arose and raised his hand to quiet the people. Let me give to you just one example of Bible prophecies, and I could list many, many. In the 13th chapter of the book of Isaiah, we find predictions about the city of Babylon. Babylon was a very famous city. It was astride the Euphrates River. It was approximately 60 miles in circumference, 14 or 15 miles on each side. It was in a strategic location as far as commerce was concerned because it lay astride the Euphrates River which stretched within 100 miles of the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Indian Ocean. It was near to the Tigris River which uh, brought produce and uh, economy down from their great country of Assyria. Its walls were 300 feet high and 90 feet thick broad enough at the top so that seven chariots could race abreast at the same time. And yet at the very height of its power, Isaiah said in the, in the 13th chapter of the book of Isaiah, beginning with verse 19, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there, but the wild beasts, beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. The owls shall dwell there, and the sartors shall dance there, and the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. There are five specific predictions made there in the 13th chapter of the book of Isaiah, and every one of them have literally come true. The city of Babylon today lies waste. It has never been in, inhabited or rebuilt. The Arabian does not pitch tent there. The shepherds do not keep their folds there. But wild beasts of the desert stay there. And the houses are literally filled with doleful creatures just like Isaiah predicted. The Bible has more testimonies in its behalf than any other book that's ever been written. Let me give you just a few samples. Napoleon Bonaparte read the Bible and said, The Bible is no mere book. It's a living creature with a power that conquers all who oppose it. Queen Victoria said, That book accounts for the supremacy of England. George Washington read the Bible and said, It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Thomas Huxley, the man who is credited with coining the word agnostic, read the Bible and said, the Bible has been the Magna Carta of the poor and the oppressed. The human race is not in a position to dispense with it. We could also quote Nelson Gleck and Isaac Newton and Helen Keller and Daniel Webster, and virtually every learned person in the world has read the Bible. One of my favorite testimonies about the Bible comes from a lady who is neither rich nor famous. She passed away several years ago, and Scott tape, scotch tape to the front page of her Bible was this little poem. Though its cover is worn, and though its pages are torn, and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide. It's a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. 
And each promise I find soothes and gladdens my mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. And I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while possessing its blessings divine. But finally, let me point to you that the Bible is alive. It is living and active. I hold here in my hands a package full of seeds. These happen to be wheat seeds. They don't seem to be alive. You could examine that little seed very closely, very carefully. You could bisect it. You could examine it under a microscope. And you wouldn't be able to see the germ of life which is contained there. But when you plant the seed, something miraculous begins to happen. It starts to grow. You see, the infinite creator God placed a bit of himself in this little seed. And this seed is different from a seed which man could make. This seed is alive. And it is active. It will not only press its way through the crust of the earth and stretch toward the sun, but it has the power to reproduce itself and to create other grains of wheat. Here we have a living seed, the Word of God. It's alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. You can't read this book and be unaffected. Some of the greatest unbelievers in the world have tried it and found themselves converted. Lou Wallace, an unbelieving lawyer, read this book and wrote Ben-Hur. Giovanni Papini was an unbeliever, but he read the Bible and was converted. C.S. Lewis was an unbeliever, but he read the Bible and he became a Christian. One of the most famous unbelievers was a man by the name of William Ramsey, later knighted and is now known as Sir William Ramsey. He didn't content himself, however, with sitting in an Oxford uh, library and uh, criticizing the Bible, he rolled up his sleeves and said, I'm going to go out and prove the Bible to be, uh, to be wrong. And he selected the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts because Luke seemed to be so specific about everything. And he thought this would be the simplest and easiest place to prove the Bible wrong. For 40 years, he traveled the Mediterranean world attempting to prove the Bible wrong. He failed. He failed miserably. And at the end, instead of criticizing the Bible, he wrote book after book in defense of the Holy Bible. Here I have just a few of Sir William Ramsey's books. And every one of these books is a Bible-believing book, vindicating God and speaking in behalf of the Bible. Let me speak a word to you now. We've talked about the Bible, and we've tried to create an interest in the Bible in your life. Some of you have got a copy of the Bible, but you do not read it. I want to challenge you now to read that Bible, to believe it, to be safe, and to practice it, to be holy.